Well, good afternoon. We've had a wonderful set of conversations uh, today, and I hope everyone's taking away a lot of great insights uh, from the robust lineup of speakers that have shared their expertise with us. I'm Barbara Van Allen, President and CEO of the Economic Club of New York. It's my honor to next introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, Ruth Pratt, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Alphabet. Ruth joined Google as Senior VP and Chief Financial Officer in May of 2015, and has also held the same title at Alphabet since it was created in October of 2015. She's responsible for finance, business operations, real estate, and workplace services. Prior to joining Google, Ruth was Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Morgan Stanley and actually held various, very senior roles there uh, before that time. She's a member of the Board of Directors of Blackstone Inc. and the Stanford Management Company and the Board of Trustees of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She previously spent 10 years on Stanford University's Board of Trustees. She holds a BA from Stanford, a Master's in Science from the London School of Economics, and an MBA from the Wharton School. Our interviewer for this session is Marie Jose Kravis, a vice chair and senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and chair emerita of the Economic Club of New York. Due to a schedule conflict, the interview was pre-taped just a few days ago, and we're gonna now turn to that recording. Thank you. So Ruth, it's wonderful to have you, and I thank you for taking the time. And um, as we've had these women's uh, forums every year uh, to mark um, Women's Month, the month of March, there has been one recurring issue, and it's recurring again today, and it's the access of women to capital. So before we talk about Ruth, Ruth at Google and technology and so on, maybe we could look back and talk about your role at Morgan Stanley, your role in investment banking, and maybe share with us your views on this whole issue of access to capital, for example. Well, first, it is great to be with you. I'm only sorry we're not physically in the same place, but it's wonderful to be with you. So thank you and with the whole group. So I, look, reflecting on my career, I was started at Morgan Stanley about 35 years ago, and I would say everything has changed and nothing has changed, you know, in, in a certain sense. When I look across industries, I look at access to capital, I look at roles, there's been improvement, no question about it. More women have a seat at the table, a bigger seat at the table. But at the end of the day, very much to your question, you look at the data, CEOs, chairmen, leaders of asset management firms, venture firms, private equity firms, uh, and it's still disproportionately held by men, um, those, those senior roles. So I think one of the key elements is we just need to continue to press forward as we have been. In contrast to when I started, we are having these conversations. In contrast to when I started, there's data that underscores that diverse leadership, diverse groups actually results in more robust conversations, better outcomes, better financial performance. And so we are on a journey and we have continued to see progress. Uh, it's just not at a fast enough pace, no question about it. I would say when I was at Morgan Stanley, one of the most important conversations I had was when I actually moved to the equity capital markets floor to take on the role of leading technology equity capital markets. And at the time, the head of institutional equities called me to his office and he said, I think, I think you're gonna soar, but I wanna be your senior air cover. I will backstop you if there's an issue and I would like to see you soar and I will be your senior air cover. And what really struck me about this senior air cover point is I was so grateful to know if there was ever an instance in which I had an issue, whether that was a business issue or you know, meeting kind of the, the blockages that you have as a woman going through the industry, there was somebody I could turn to. And I think we all need senior air cover and we all need to be senior air cover. And these kinds of conversations and the roles we all play, the role of men as allies, the role of these kinds of conversations are what give me optimism that we'll continue to see progress. So did you use that senior air cover often? I don't want to pry into specific issues, but it might be interesting to uh, to see how that worked. You know, when there were, whenever there were areas where I was wrestling with a question, an issue, a substantive business issue, it was great to have a place that I thought was a both a safe place 
um, but also a place to get great judgment. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I credit with my career and career choices is having terrific sponsors. People who took risk on me and who were really direct with me on issues. And that, those were both business issues and career issues. And so I view him as one of the many people who I credit as being a sponsor along the way. So many of the women who participate in this uh, women's symposium um, have encountered great skepticism. I mean, many of them are running or starting up, starting companies. And so in the startup world, in the venture capital world or private equity, they find that they encounter um, what seems to be much more skepticism um, than their male colleagues. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, or if there are other biases uh, that are involved. Um, but other women have said to me that they feel also that women don't show the same confidence as men in, um, in, in selling themselves and in selling their ideas. And I wonder in your experience, if you've encountered, I think both sides of that, both the skepticism and maybe the more modest uh, approach that women take. I think probably yes to both, but if I would go instead to, and so what do we do about it? You know, I've already said the importance of sponsors. I think mm -hmm. actually having that senior air cover, having that confirmation, affirmation, both opens doors and also reinforces confidence around the ask. The other critically important point in my view is anchor anything you're doing in data because it is harder to argue the merits around data. And it's you know, kind of anchor it in data and the rest will follow is a phrase I use all the time. And, and I don't think data necessarily, when I t say data, what, I, what I'm looking for is a way to help people think through issues. I often say I'm much more interested in sensitivity analysis than I am a flat presentation about what is the answer. Because what you're trying to do is engage people who come at issues with a different set of expectations or bias. And so how do you get someone to engage in a discussion about the art of the possible? Where is my business going to go? What is the potential for long-term growth? Let's dimension what are the key variables. And if you can anchor it in data, one, I find it's easier to drive the conversation. And two, it, you're coming from a position where you, you can argue a lot of different elements of it, but help me understand which parameters are important. And so for me, that builds the confidence to say, I know I've got a point of view that you should listen to. Just engage with it, because I'm not coming with an answer. I'm coming with a way of thinking that's anchored in data. Both of those, I think, help bust through what might otherwise be discomfort in the ask or resistance from the <clears throat> recipient. I'd like to when, go back and st still keep us a little uh, back um, to the dot-com boom in the late 90s and how uh, the explosion of support for a number of dot-com companies, many of which, a large part, proportion of which don't exist today. And the world today where the focus is less on eyeballs and much more, <clears throat> excuse me, much more on products or services and new ideas. And I'm sure you're, right in the midst of that. Are you, are you really feeling that big difference or is it just something that we seem to perceive on, from the outside? Well, if you go back to that 2000 period, I think there's always a risk when capital is free and people can just do whatever they, they want. And it was very concerning. I was running technology banking at the time. And I, I'll, I'll never forget, everyone who had anything that went online thought they had the next great thing. Right. And my, my point consistently was, if you're not doing anything transformative with technology, there's nothing that's durable. So how are you building something? How do you connect the dots to the future for a business that is durable, transformative, and truly is not just an extension of, of the real world? And so um, it wasn't surprising. In fact, Mary Meeker was my partner at the time as the research analyst and kept very clearly saying, the overwhelming majority of these will fail. There is nothing differentiated. There is nothing here. Now, if you fast forward, most certainly, I think one of the key lessons that we see time and time again is that if you're not focused on quality growth, if it's growth for growth's sake, it doesn't end well. And there are plenty of companies where the focus has just been grow fast and then figure it out later. I think the problem with that is one, you 
inculcate a culture which is more about growth at all costs rather than quality growth, and that is hard to reposition. And you don't end up with a durable, sustainable business model. So when I'm looking at you know the, the way we look at businesses, it's plain, it goes right back to the earliest days in finance. What is the value of a business? It's the net present value of future cash flow. So yes, you are you may not know what that is in those earliest days when you're in technology, but you want to connect the dots to the future and focus on quality growth at all times. I think that's one of the most important lessons in, in every volatile environment. And that was one of the attractions that Google had towards you. Um, when they brought you in, <clears throat> you had a real challenge about financial issues and also that quality growth. Talk to us about coming from Wall Street to Silicon Valley and um, the challenges of um, cost cutting or I'd say financial or financial uh, responsibility, fiscal responsibility within a corporation that has grown that quickly? Well, you know, I think to me, there are a number of lessons that I got at Morgan Stanley that were so relevant when I came here. One of the first ones was if you don't invest for long-term growth, you are sowing the seeds of your long-term destruction. And I learned that in one of my <clears throat> first deals. I was on um, the, the hostile takeover attempt of Gillette. And the CEO at the time said, do whatever you need to do to defend me, but you cannot touch my R&D budget and I will not tell you what it is. And it was frustrating, but his comment was, I would rather not be an independent company. I'd, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather actually die than see than try and run this without this R&D budget. We were able to keep the company independent, and years later learned that that R&D budget was about the sensor razor. The the case study was written up in the book from good to great, because he knew that if you don't invest for long term growth, he didn't need to be independent. And I, I saw that firsthand as a young associate at Morgan Stanley, and it's really colored the way I've looked ever since then. If you're not investing for long-term growth, you will pay for it later. And in too often, as a banker, I saw companies that would come basically when they were out of runway. And it was like, now what do I do? Now what do I sell? Well, it's too late at that point. So investing in long-term growth is critical. To me, if you're doing it in, a, in any company where you're trying to do something transformative, you must reach, and if you're reaching, by definition, not everything works. So I think the flip side of investing for long-term growth is actually pruning, stack ranking, exiting certain things, deprecating, whatever word you want to use, mm -hmm. they go together. And so <clears throat> your question's a, a really important one that I'm often asked about. How do, you, how do you get into the mindset, the notion of choices? Well, if you are taking risk, by definition, everything doesn't work or you're not taking enough risk or you're not being honest enough with yourself about it. So to me, the narrative very much was it's about the two together. And Google has always been about investing in long-term growth. And so what we are looking to do is make sure that where things aren't working, we're reinvesting those in the highest priorities. But how does stack ranking work in an organization like Google, which as you say, has always been um, strong on investing in long-term growth, but also in taking risks and experimenting and exploring new ideas, but also new products and so on? Yeah, there are a couple of different things. <clears throat> One is a, an approach I used at Morgan Stanley, which is if you make the resource envelope for any business leader tight enough by definition, resource, the, the leaders need to stack rank what they're doing. And I consistently said, everybody's got a bottom 10%, but you as the business leader are gonna be in a better position to know where you wanna put your priorities. And so it starts with an envelope, as we call it, a resource envelope that is tight enough that it forces the stack rank. Second, you wanna make sure that you don't miss those breakthrough opportunities. So you do wanna make it safe to have sort of a sandbox, an area where you can explore. At Google, they started years ago with the concept of 20% time. If you're an engineer and you have a great product idea and you wanna go explore it, you can either do it here with 20% time where you can go off and do what you want, or you will go do it elsewhere and get funded. And so things like Gmail came out of 20% time 
We then concluded that actually you need more than 20% time for something, so we created an entity called X. It is our moonshot factory. And the entire approach there is fail fast and try and iterate and come out with what are the big 10X, as we call them, moonshots. So there are two parts to it, which is one, the rigor in annual capital planning. Two is structural, create opportunities to actually explore. So, I mean, that's it's a wonderful structure and, and works at Google, obviously, if we look at the, at the results and what you've achieved. But how would you, what, what advice would you give in that sense and with that rigor and combination of rigor and risk taking to smaller companies or just startups? Yeah, there's it, there are a host of things from the all the, the questions that we've gone through. So um, when you're starting, you know, in, in much I'm making it almost sound like everything's formulaic. We start, we know exactly where things are going to go. One of the most important elements at Google today is all of our investment in AI. And years ago, our CEO Sundar Pichai said, "We are AI first. It is." Um, enabling us to enrich every element of our products, the way we relate to consumers, to advertisers, to merchants, the way we find efficiency. And in uh, many of these things, you just don't know when you start what the application may be. And we talk about um, natural language translation. When that project started as just a small thing, no one knew where it was going to go. And so you do, there is an element of experimentation, no question. I don't want to suggest that everything has a clear financial model from day one. So there's an element of experimentation. But I think this question that I always asked as a banker in technology, what is your vision? How do I connect the dots to the future? Where do you think this can go? Is still a fair question, A. B, for a small company, I think one of the very important elements fairly early on in one's life a cycle is ensuring that you're building that operational base to deliver quality. So as an example, as a finance person, I think every manual process is an accident waiting to happen. I think being able to have a solid IT base on which to rest is absolutely critical and <clears throat> enables you to go faster. It's not the sexiest thing to invest in, but if you're growing at the pace at which technology strong technology companies do, by the time you realize what you need to build in excellence, you've gone so quickly, it's hard to catch up. So getting someone on your team who has pattern recognition because they've scaled things in the past, I think is invaluable. When I got here, that was one of the things that I added to the team, a lot of amazing talent, but I wanted to bring in people who had pattern recognition from having been in good times and bad times, who had seen a lot of different kind of growth elements and requirements. And I think that diversity of experience also is really valuable as you're going through a growth curve. So you use the word diversity, but in a different, in a different context of experience. Tell us about women and technology, your experience. So I, I think that at the highest level, there's more impatience here than there was in finance. I, you know, I met, as I'm sure many on this call, as you, uh, you know, met many issues along the way, if that's a polite way to put the problems, um, being a woman in finance, you know. Um, and yet I found out here, there's a level of impatience, which I attribute to the fact that everything that is touched is so transformative. So if you can teach a car to self-drive, why can't we solve this faster? And so there's an urgency, which I think is extraordinary and actually would encourage women in all industry to, to, to have, because it forces the dialogue around what more now. We've all heard tone from the top is important. That's table stakes. But if you don't put rigor and process and data around it, you're not going to accelerate the pace of change. And to me, that's one of the biggest elements. So all of the rigor and process that comes out of this um, urgency and sense of accountability is heightened out here, in my view, relative to, to what I experienced in New York. Well, we often hear, and we used to hear it in the, in the economic and financial world, well, I just can't find women. Um, they're not there. <laughs> And, um, you know, the argument, and we've heard it, I'm sure you've used it also, is that, well, maybe you're looking, you're looking in the wrong places, 
or maybe you're trying to hire yourself and <laughs> it's not quite uh, the way you're going to find women or more a more diverse workforce. Is that something you encounter? Is it much deeper than that in terms of really women in science, women doing STEM uh, studies and so on? Is there a dearth of women? Um, I think the excuse there, there just there aren't enough. I, I agree with that. I think that that's problematic. We, you know, you, you put anyone in 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 an underrepresented group in a leadership position, and the multiplier effect it has for others who say I can be that person is profound. There's one thing I, w I would want to add. I'm going to circle back to your question. The reality is, all of us are actually in technology, every industry, because when you think about this digital transformation, it truly has accelerated. And what that means is any industry you're in, you should be embracing technology, whether it's, again, about revenues, efficiencies, the ability to deliver. So we're all in tech, first of all. Second point is there are many roles in technology that are not just pure computer science. So anybody who's saying, hey, can I enter that field? Um, I'm not a technologist, I'm having an amazing time in a technology company, but even more broadly, when I think about AI, one of the really important elements of AI is what is called human-centered AI. If you don't want to just program and replicate what's in the world today, much of which, as you've said, your questions isn't working all that well, you want to bring in multiple disciplines. So human-centered AI is about bringing computer scientists together with humanists social scientists, if you're going to, for example, think about how AI can be applied to bank lending, let's make sure we don't replicate the biases of bank lending that have plagued society for, for decades, if not centuries. So bring in multiple perspectives. So there are lots of different roles. And then to your point, I think we can always do more. And so programs that encourage women to get into STEM STEM programs, I think, are fantastic. We're doing a lot of that with things like a tech maker program, which are ambassadors and reach outs to young younger women in high school. So yes, increase the funnel, but I think that's a that's important, but that's not an excuse. There's still amazing talent in a lot of different places and a lot of different roles out there. Well, I was hoping you could tell us a little more about the Tech Makers program because I think that's a very interesting initiative. Yeah, so what we did is we um, worked to create a, a host of women who are effectively ambassadors who come in and um, convene groups of women globally um, uh, in, in order to help them understand what is, what, what's the art of the possible, what's the career, what are some of the openings and options. But you are also reaching out, uh, you're not just bringing them in, you're reaching out to schools and so on to convey that message. We work um, through a lot of schools and a number of different programs. We actually even have a program outside of the U.S. called Mind the Gap, which is for younger younger students. Um, and so the whole objective is to continue to broaden the, the 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 funnel and to make it really clear what is in the art of the possible. And so we do it in a host of different ways. We also have a program I'm really proud of called Grow with Google, which is a digital skills training program, which reaches out to underrepresented, is disproportionately underrepresented groups, which is women, but also black, Latinx, and others. And it's really about giving people in a short period of time the digital skills they need in areas like data analytics or user experience, project management, so that in three to six months they can get a certificate that opens <coughs> for them. And how does how do people people just uh, they go online and, and sign up with that or is that going done through the public school system or how is that so Grow with Google is a program if you uh, you can actually Google it. And they're, mm -hmm. they're really proud that we actually have four certificates. Our view on all of these digital skills training programs is it's wonderful to do them. But if we can do them uh, with a broad consortium of companies, then this, if I step back, what we do is three to eight months or three to six to eight months, you get a certificate in one of these areas. but we want the certificate to be something you can use anywhere. So we built out in the U.S. a consortium of more than 150 companies. Anyone on this call who is interested in joining the consortium, love to have you because basically you get trained people with this credential in a specific area who are up and running. And what we've further done is we just recently announced um, a program where we're actually 
funding um, any kind of support that is needed. So if you need daycare or other things, there's a, a certificate support program that we're also doing. Main point is, yes, you can get skills, go to Grow with Google, and you'll, you'll see the various programs. Wonderful. I'd like you to talk maybe about how the pandemic has also changed work life. And uh, Google has, uh, I think, quite a sophisticated hybrid model of work. And could you share that with us and how you came to those decisions? So pretty early on in the pandemic, we, we concluded that people would want to continue working at home post-pandemic. Google lives on Google Workspace. We have collaborative docs, collaborative tools. Many times, even pre-pandemic, I would do a meeting on video with colleagues who were down, down the street, in another, you know, down in Sunnyvale and I'm in Mountain View because it was just efficient. <clears throat> so the transition wasn't that hard. And then as we went into work from home, we said, you know, we think people are gonna wanna continue to have the productivity lift that comes from being at home, but we want people back in the office at least sometime. There's collaboration, there's serendipity, there's culture, there's a whole host of reasons. So we settled early on on a notion of this hybrid three, two work week, but we said we also wanna give people more agency. So we added things like four weeks of the year, you can work wherever you want. This concept of giving people some more choice, we also massively broadened out the number of locations. And we said for some roles, if you don't need to come in, you can, let's try remote every day. And so we've got quite a mixture depending on what the role is. Some it's just not practical to assume you could be remote every day. And so we're trying to mix it up. We're experimenting both in the structure of the day, but also in how we use our workspace. So refitting our space so that when you come in, it's all about convening. So it's walls that move around. You can be a group of four, a group of eight. We're looking at different things with technology so that, for example, we built these campgrounds outside. We have the privilege of wonderful weather 12 months of the year. And they have um, screens in the circle so that if you're not here, it makes it easier to still have the conversation. So it's a combination of what's the day like and how to use technology and how to use space. You mentioned culture. Does that make it difficult, more difficult to create a corporate culture when people, many people have never met one another or people are working for remote spaces, have a different attachment? Um, how do you keep the, the very, very strong culture in a much more diffuse environment like that? Yeah, it's a really important question. I think for all of us as leaders, it puts a, a really important point on how do you make sure you're bringing people together and convening. So I think culture benefits from this hybrid structure in that you're a magnet for talent. People do want to have that flexibility that comes with working at least part of the time from home. You get better talent when you're opening up the number of sites, in particular diverse talent. We are, we're really excited with what we're seeing in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit. So you can get more talent, which is really exciting. But to your point, the heart of your point is, okay, but you're not together every day. Like I grew up with the benefit of being in that meeting pulled in at the last minute. So you just have to be substantially more deliberate about it. And I would say it's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that we're finding ways to convene people. In certain respects, when you're convening them on a video conference call, you've got everyone's name up there and you can make sure you're calling on people. So you can argue that there are benefits from finding ways to do things online, but you do have to be more deliberate about it. You need to make sure when you're bringing people together, you're doing it in a way that's worth their time to come in. Like a, just to say three, two, but on those days when you're in the office, we're not doing things together. What's the point? I don't need somebody to check the box that they came in. I need to be with them when they're in. So I think that as leaders heighten responsibility, but it's gonna get us a more um, dynamic and excited and productive workforce. Has it changed also your policies or practices with regard, for example, to childcare? Well, one of the important things we did is there's, um, I'm, I, we, I and we, uh, the leadership group here, I think like many, are very concerned about wellness issues as a result of the pandemic. And the burden on women, sadly, has been high, very high. And so one of the things that we did very early on is created uh, carer's leave which is you can take 14 weeks off in whole or in part, a couple hours every day, however you wanna do it, if you just need 
a break because you're trying to juggle kids who aren't in school or parents or something else. So that is one of the important elements is how do you think through programs that make it easy for people to say, I want to keep working here. I love what I'm doing. I just can't, I can't figure out a way to get all the pieces of the puzzle to work. And I think as leaders, you know, one of the, the critical elements is make it safe for people to say, I, I, I need to have this conversation. This isn't working. This is too stressful because I don't want anyone to conclude I can't, I can't handle both and so I need to give up Google. What I want is to help them figure out how they get that mix to work. And so in things like Cares Leave or the hybrid work approach or the fully remote, you're actually engaging in a dialogue about what people want in their whole life. Have you had a similar experience to many other corporations where um, women have disproportionately left the workforce? Um, we haven't seen- been more reticent to come back. Well, I've, I, I've most certainly seen the industry-wide data, and it's very concerning that women have gone back, I don't know if it's decades, but it's pretty awful uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so we've been extremely focused on how do we make sure we're providing the right support through things like Cares Leave or this flexibility on structure. So I haven't seen that. I think we're all acutely aware of the, of the, of the concern and you know, I'm I'm often asked about the question of mom guilt. This and and you know, it's a it's an interesting term. I you know, I hate to say I most certainly feel it. It's like shouldn't it be another term? But <laughs> I've always always feeling like you're not doing enough, and this this sense I'm not doing enough. And when your kids are there, and we've all seen it, where you're on a video call and some kids come climbing on the lap, it's wonderful when you see them. It's like we're trying to make this easy. And so to me, the way to deal with that is create both process, like things like cares leave or flexibility timeout, however you wanna do it, but also make it really clear, we want you as a professional long-term, we know this is hard. I, the number of times I say, admit to yourself, this is historic, it is hard. We can have the conversation, we can get to the other side. So I think it, again, it comes back to, yes, there's no question, we're, we're, I've been hard on myself in my career. My friends, women friends have said the same thing. I see it all the time. Let's have the conversation. I think that when you do, um, you're gonna find that, that your, your, your company wants you to stay. It takes too long to hire, recruit, and train. So let's, that's our, at least our approach. Make it work. We gotta figure out a way to make it work. And what about pay equity? Well, so it goes back to, um, absolutely critical. It goes back to my comment, which is you can't just have tone from the top. You need to have data and transparency around it, and you need to have rigor and process around it. And so that whole portfolio of things, there's no, it's, it, no one s single item that is going to help move things forward. So I talked about the, you know, the transparency report is a critical one, the check-ins constantly on recruiting, hiring, retention. But pay equity, every year we go through a rigorous process to make sure that bias hasn't come into either the PERF process or comp. And again, the rigor around it, I think, is part of just ensuring that there's equity in, in all that we do and we're trying to create as much opportunity and, and fairness. Um, and again, we would say that we're not as far along as we would like, society's not as far as along as we would like, but I think this rigor and process around it are critical sort of um, pillars to getting it right. And you feel the needle is moving in the right direction? I think the needle is moving in the right direction. As I said, one, conversations like this didn't occur. When I started, you know, I remember when I got pregnant with my first <coughs> child, we didn't even talk about it. I didn't, you wanted to sort of hide it and just, you didn't have this kind of conversation. And when it got brought in to have men in the conversation, and the term allies, which again, when did that, I don't know when that came, but it was certainly late in my career. And it's fantastic that collectively we're saying there has to be a difference. At senior levels, we're holding ourselves accountable to see progress along the way. And so, yes, I, I am optimistic. Uh, I wish it was faster. And I think impatience, as I said, is great. So speaking of impatience or maybe vision, um, <clears throat> what are you most excited about when you think of uh, Google in the next five years? I'm not asking you to reveal trade secrets, but 
<laughs> no, I think um, I think to me it goes back to something we have already talked about. It's the implications of AI for all of us in every industry. And um, you know, if there are areas, for example, around accessibility um, that are extraordinary with technology, how you can be ever more helpful for people who are hearing impaired or visual and what technology can do. Small, medium businesses, how we can help small, medium businesses. You know, as I mentioned, one in three said they would have failed without digital skills, but the ability to actually help them where they need critical. In healthcare, an area that you and I have spoken about, you know, mm -hmm. we, as an example, um, through AI, we are able to detect early stage metastatic breast cancer uh, better than, than, than doctors can. And so I've heard doctors say, this is not artificial intelligence, it's augmented. It helps us see where we should focus. Same with colonoscopies. Uh, the, so it's on and on and on. So what am I excited about? The ability to transform what we're doing in ways that make them ever more helpful, productive through using AI really across industries and you know, working with our, our cloud team and they're thinking through how do you apply AI in every industry with data analytics to create better products, better solutions. You know, on the very important topic of, and I could keep going on this, so I'll give you just one more than climate change. AI, similarly, we're using uh, as, as a way to help look at things like what's going on through your supply chain, scope three and deforestation, and you combine geospatial data with data analytics. Um, so and we're looking at flood predictions. So applied in so many ways, you know, responsibly applied can really make a, a fundamental and exciting difference. How do you socialize that concept so that people understand it not as uh, you know, the Orwellian future or people being replaced by all these machines, uh, but that you may use the word complement um, existing activities and enrich them uh, and augment them. How do you socialize that? Because I don't think we've done a very good job. You're, no, you're sadly, you're very right. You know, a couple of years ago, um, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, said that AI, like any technology, is like fire, the ability to actually be used for good, to sterilize, to heat, and of course there's destruction and the, the critical element is how is it used. We created something called um, our AI principles around ethical use of AI that we use as, as a you know, critical set of conversations and guideposts um, internally. Uh, but I think that, that the most important element of it is seeing the application in ways that are responsible, helpful, uh, empowering in the right ways. And, and so that continues to be the key element. I think this notion that it's, in many respects, augmented intelligence, that it can add to what we do is uh, very key. But all of us, like with every technology, uh, needs to be responsibly applied. Well, wonderful, Ruth. I can tell that you're having a wonderful time at Google and making a huge difference. Do you have a final message for the women on this call? Uh, well, first, it's great that we're engaged in this conversation. I would say if there was anything I look back on in, in my career, it does go back to make sure that you never stop learning. And whenever I got to a point in my career where I felt I was plateauing, I went to someone and said, what's my highest and best use? They helped open doors for me. Many times doors, I said, you know what? That doesn't sound interesting. And I was told, you know what? You're wrong. Here are the reasons, and we would engage in a debate. You can only have that great debate and conversation if you have a sponsor, someone who takes risk on you, someone you trust. And then finally, have a full life. You asked some great questions, Marie Jose, as always, about how do you, how do you manage through times like this? But I, I think that if you don't have a full life, whatever it is, children, community activities, sports, whatever, you will burn out. And it can't be on a timeline. It, you just throw yourself in, figure out a way to get that mix to work. You know, as, as you know well, I had cancer at a young age, and um, at the time I stepped back and I said, well, what, what do I need to do if I don't have much more time? And the answer was, I have no regrets. I had a wonderful husband, three amazing children, a career I loved. Nothing, nothing was on hold. You, you can make it work, and there are substantially more people around who want to see you succeed. So throw yourself into it. It will work, uh, and keep learning and having fun. Yes, I think the 
the worst thing you want to say is I wish I had. Absolutely agree. Well, thank you so much, Ruth, for joining us and for sharing your insights and for just being so candid and well, so thank, good. Thank you so much. It's always wonderful to be with you. And thanks for your leadership on this important issue. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was an incredible conversation. And uh, many thanks to Ruth and Marie Jose for being a part of today's conference. I think these, uh, these Zoom uh, meetings just keep getting better. That one was so loaded with really great ideas and uh, smart approaches that I think we can all use. So this wraps up our four, fourth session of the day. Our next and final session uh, starts at two o'clock Eastern time. And as we've heard from other speakers throughout the day, two years after the onset of COVID-19, women's participation in the workforce has started to recover. This upcoming panel will bring together CEOs from Canada, France, and the United States to discuss access to capital, setting the tone at the top, recruiting, retaining, and of course, equity. And I'm pleased to share that John Williams, the president and CEO of the New York Federal Reserve Bank and our club chair will be uh, joining us to do the closing uh, of the day with his summary remarks right after. You should have all received the link to join and we look forward to seeing you after the break in approximately 30 minutes. If for some reason you don't have your link, please reach out to events at econclubny.org. Again, thank you for joining us. See you in a few minutes.